Welcome to Recovering Addict. I'm LT, your host, a recovering grateful alcoholic. How are you guys doing tonight? Hello, everybody. I'm Felice Weaver, your co-host for tonight, married to an alcoholic addict. Oh, yeah. Definitely that. Definitely an alcoholic addict. My goodness, it's Tuesday. Everybody in the house. So if you're catching the replay of this, I'm a recovering alcoholic addict. Two times in my life, I hit rock bottom. One in the early 2000s with meth. Ended up committing a second degree felony. Spent a year or so in jail. Four months in a halfway house. Dug my way out of that. And then got clean. And I became an alcoholic in my late 30s. I started drinking a fifth a night and had to check myself into a hospital to detox. Spent five months in an IOP program. And... Uh, yeah, now I'm all about recovery. For the first 40 years of my life, I basically was selfish, taking up space in this world, breathing everybody's air, uh, waste of skin, whatever you want to call me, as I was living in my character defects, realizing that I'm the problem now, and I was trying to use drugs and alcohol as the solution, and it got me nowhere. Living through my character defects in my mind, my addict mind, only got me to jails and institutions. If I didn't stop when I stopped, and if I don't continue to stay abstinent from alcohol, what's the third one left on the option? Death. Glad you didn't make it to death. I almost did a couple times. She's seen me a couple times. One time I did a whip it, and she thought I died. Yeah, he turned like this awful, awful <laughs> yellowish green color. I'm pretty sure it's what dead bodies look like. Yeah, whippets. You guys remember those whippets? Oh, man, we used to steal those and do as many as we could in a row. Michael, Raina, Gina. Hello, Jenny? everybody. Jenny, 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 Jenny Lynn Rail. Jenny, nice Ooh, to see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I did. So glad you're here, Marilyn. Michael. Cody W. What's up, brother? Rosie D. Glad you're in the house. Bill, what's going on? Marilyn, Jeffrey, Alicia, Holly Ford. What's going on? I'm related to some Fords. My cousins, my first cousins are Fords out here in Utah. I wonder if we're related somehow. Polly, what's going on, brother? What's up, cuz? How y'all's doing? James. How's it going, James Joyner? Nice to see you. Aaron, welcome. Hey, Wonderful Aaron. as always. And Raina, Rosie D. We got Merck up in the house. Oh, man, I got to hear Merck's story today, you guys. Wow, what a privilege. Not what I expected, to tell you the truth. I stereotyped him, I guess. How's my hair looking today, Rosie? Shiny as usual? Chevy guy. Yeah, me too. I'm a Chevy guy too. I like Chevys, GMCs and Chevys. Uh, my favorite vehicle I had was my 01 Suburban. It had an 8.1 liter in it. Oh, man, that thing was awesome. I put a six-inch lift on it, murdered oh, nice. it out, 35s. It was a monster truck. It was awesome. I should have not got rid of that, man. I'm kicking myself every day. I had a booming system in it. Oh, man, that thing could pull just like a diesel. That thing could pull the house off the foundation, I tell you what. It was awesome. So on the private Facebook page, I put a poll out. <laughs> to see I got the link. if I should start a Zoom meeting or not in this group. I said, have, I've had a few people ask, do we have any Zoom meetings in this group? And if there's enough interest, I'll start one. And so I put out a poll. It was either yes, no, or I already attend. And I've had so far 21 people say yes. I'm going to let this poll go. Well, it's kind of stupid to let it go any further, 21 to 1. But uh, I've been looking into Zoom. And I'm probably going to set one up. I'll make it on a strict, tight schedule once, maybe twice a week. So the next post you'll see on Facebook about Zoom is to kind of coordinate a good central time for everybody because I know we got friends out east and friends out west. Uh, maybe on the weekend or something, maybe a Saturday, maybe even a Sunday, maybe Sunday morning. I don't know. We'll just, we'll throw it out there. We'll gather them up. We'll take it's a collective, nice. whatever the median is. That's what we'll shoot for. Um, I want to get into the show today because I want to talk about co-addiction. And this is going to be a really educational, uh, really edu educational stream here today. And there's also something else I want to talk about is we are going to give away $100, just like we did with that $50 giveaway last time. Let me bring this up here. I'll let Raina you guys was take our a big screen. big winner last time. Congrats last time, Raina. Yeah, I'll let you guys take a screenshot of this so you can see the rules. It's not, nothing's free, guys. Of course, we're going to make you work for it. Welcome, Betsy and your husband. Who's Betsy? Betsy. Oh, Betsy. Our friend Betsy. Welcome. Right on. Good to see you. All right, so here's the here's the rules right here. Hundred dollar drawing. Member, so you have to be a member of the recovering avid attic uh, private. I should put private here. Hold on. They huh? spell private. Changing the rules. 
Just kidding. No, Kiara, yeah. So you got to have joined the Recovering Addict private Facebook page. Uh, you take and share three of your favorite streams that you've seen, okay, on social media or with someone who you think needs it. So three of them, and you have to have proof. And so you got to take a screenshot of that, post a screenshot on the private Facebook page with your Venmo, Venmo Cash App, or Facebook pay name. And then next Tuesday, one week from today, we're going to draw one name out of our bucket, just like we did last time, right there. And then we are going to, on the spot, live here, send you 100 bucks. So I'm going to put this up one more time and let you take a screenshot of it so you can see the rules. Member of Recovering Addicts private Facebook page. Share three of your favorite live streams on social media with someone who you think could help or with somebody you think could help. Take a screenshot for proof and then post your screenshots of your three videos you shared on the private Facebook page with your Venmo Cash App or Facebook pay name. And now you don't have to put your Venmo Cash App or pay name. You can just put your name if you don't want to throw that name on there. I understand privacy and all that stuff. Um, but if you just post that screenshot uh, on there with your name so we know, and then we'll tally them up Tuesday, and then we will announce a winner. Winner, 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 winner. Does sound like a plan? Sounds like a plan to me. So hope you guys got that screenshot. If you didn't, let me know, and I can throw that back up there. One hundo. That's right, Mark. One hundo. I'll put that link one more time for the Facebook page in case somebody missed it. And I'll be getting us a Zoom meeting account because the overwhelming – and I have people from uh, – I'll probably want to do it on the weekend because I have friends that are in my IOP who want to be a part of it. And if we do it on the weekday, they are still in uh, – they're still in this intensive outpatient program, which is every night from 5.30 to 9. So they're, they're not able to join the nightly stuff, which is okay. Uh, I actually was in a two-hour Zoom meeting today. So for the first hour from 5.30 to 6.30, it was a transition. One of my friends that is in there, uh, she just transitioned, which means she completed all the way up through step five plus the assignments. She spent about five, six months. It, usually, it takes about five, six months to go through this place where you get counseled and you work steps one through five with multiple assignments, a book report and all kinds of good stuff. And then just counseling, counseling, counseling every night. Oh, and then on Wednesday nights, it's yoga. That part was always cool. And then uh, from 6.30 to 7.30, I spent my first Zoom meeting back in my aftercare program with my counselor. And I was able to vent to him everything I've been venting to you guys. What are you laughing at? Marina. She said, I can't see it. Besides, I don't think my heart could take it. Plus, I fall too much. <laughs> go, go falling out of bed on us, Rena. <laughs> yeah, go falling out of your bed. Hello, Dory. Cody says he has no friends on Facebook, only downloaded it from a recovering community. There you go. Well, Cody, share it, email it, do whatever you can. And I mean, give us your best attempt and you're you're in. No big deal. Win a win a chicken dinner over there. Polly's going to win some do moolah. Awesome, Jeffrey. How was your Zoom meeting? Did you, anything stand out to you that helped you out? Weekends would be perfect. My home group doesn't have any meetings on the weekends. Awesome. Okay. So I will post on Facebook after we get off of here and I will, uh, I will tally up what day and time and we'll look at Saturday and Sunday. We'll, we'll shoot for a Saturday and Sunday and uh, we'll just maybe just do it once a week. And if we get more people that want to participate, maybe we can go to twice a week. Maybe we can hit a Wednesday and a Saturday. I don't know. We'll see, but we'll, we'll work out the details, but I got an overwhelming response for a zoom meeting for recovering addict private Facebook. And so we're going to go that direction, jump on in and talk all night and we'll, we'll make it nice and structured. Just like our channel is our, our channel. We try to make it structured. So you come, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get education. You're going to get support and we're going to speak and talk about recovery and how to recover. How are we going to, how are we going to live the rest of our life in recovery if we don't continue to learn? And so this channel is here to dedicated to teach us just that. Uh, so I want to speed up my talk here through this because I want to jump into our topic, which is co-addiction. But first, let's read the uh, Kindle of the day. It's the 14th, right? Is it the 14th? Yeah. So AA thought of the day. A police captain once told about certain cases he had come across in his police work. The cause of the tra tragedy in each was drunkenness. He told his audience about a man who got into an argument with his wife while he was drunk and beat her to death. 
Then he went out and drank some more. The police captain also told about a woman who got too near the edge of an old quarry hole and she was drunk and fell 150 feet to her death. Here's the question. When I read or hear these stories, do I think about our motto, but for the grace of God, there goes I. And I have a video that could show us this motto. I was looking at it today and I contemplated playing it. And if you guys give me enough thumbs up in there after I describe what I'm about to tell you, I'll play it at the end of the show. But there's this guy who's yeah. an alcoholic who walks up and down my street. He, I'm pretty sure he got his license taken away, all that kind of stuff. He's in middle, uh, upper middle age, probably pushing 60. And he putters down to the uh, bus stop, drive, takes that bus down to the liquor store, grabs him two pints of uh, moonshine. He drinks one pint on the way home and then waddles his way back up our hill because we live in the foothills, so they're pretty steep hills. Yeah. yeah. And he just yeah. lives right around this corner. Nice guy. But anyway, one day it was June, I think. I got the date on the video, but it's right. It was a hot day, 90s. It was a 90-degree day at least, and he's walking home, and the sun, the lack of nutrition, the lack of water, the pint of moonshine got to him. And... We had to go and rescue him basically off the corner, but we recorded the whole thing. And I, as, as I do, I always got a camera going and I busted out my editing tools and we edited it and I helped him up, threw him in the truck, drove him to his house, which was only two houses away. And I let him sit in the air conditioning. We chit chatted for a minute, but I made a video about it. It's kind of, but for the grace of God, there goes I kind of video, uglifying alcohol. If you guys give me enough thumbs up, I'll play that at the end of the end of the show. But yeah, here's the meditation of the day. I must keep balance by keeping spiritual things at the center of my life. God will give me this poise and balance if I pray for it. This poise will give me in dealing with the lives of others. This balance will manifest itself more and more in my own life. I should keep marital things in their proper place and keep spiritual things at the center of my life. Then I will be at peace amid the distractions of everyday living. Mm, that's good advice. So prayer of the day, I pray that I may dwell with God at the center of my life. I pray that I may keep that inner peace at center of my being. Amen. Right there, right at the center. And I got to do that while I'm at work. And I vented to my, to my counselor and he was able to give me some good pointers. I wrote them down. He said that I need to start reciting and praying in the power as it is says in step 11. I need to check my desires that they're not overwhelming reality of things. He said that I need to enjoy. He goes, what about the journey that God has you on? Are you enjoying? This is a journey that you're learning something through this journey. Enjoy the journey. And then he goes, choose, choose to make the best of it. Choose to make the best of what you're doing right now because it's setting you up for the future success. So I took it, wrote it down and I'll be meditating on that and using that throughout work. Cause I've, I've told you guys how I deal with work and how annoying it is to me. Oh, look at all the thumbs up. All right. So I guess at the end of the end of the show, I'll play that video. It's kind of heartbreaking, but it kind of ends in a happy, happy mood. And he knows about it. He knows he's on YouTube. I run I used to run into them at the liquor store all the time. All the time. We were me and him, him and I were the same. And I was yes. headed down that exact road. All right. So chapter eight. If you have a pen and paper ready, you might want to write it down. We're going to get a little educational on you today. If you have a loved one who is dealing with you as the addict and they are not the addict, maybe have them listen in on, to, to this part. So it's pretty important. If And the, this co-addiction can, can be anybody. It's not just husband and wife. It could be a parent to children. It could be children to parents. It could be a brother to a sister or vice versa. Anybody that's affected by the actions of a, an addict could become a co-addict, a codependent co-addict. So we're going to read through some of this. We're going to get into it. I'm going to break some things down, show you some stuff. So we have a deeper understanding of what co-addiction is because once somebody gets held in the grips of co-addiction as a non-addict of drugs and alcohol, it's just as dangerous and just as uh, harmful as addiction to drugs and alcohol. And once the addict has quit using the drugs and alcohol and this codependent co-addict is still in their character defects, not realizing that they were ever even addicted to the addict can continue to harm the relationship in the future. 
and not understand why things aren't getting better after the drugs or alcohol has been removed. And so once we pinpoint who this co-addict is, uh, we'll get into this book and we will, as we read through, we'll start breaking some things down. So what is a co-addict? Who is a co-addict? So the definition of co-addiction, the textbook definition of being addicted to codependency is similar to that of co-addiction. However, co-addiction is a very specific definition that refers to the relationship between an individual and an addict. Specifically, co-addiction is dependence on the needs of control of another and placing a lower priority on one's own needs while being excessively preoccupied with the needs of the other. In fact, for an active co-addict, the decision to let go of an addict is not possible. Step one applies to the co-addict. Their lives become unmanageable. They become powerless over this addict, which is really their problem inside. Uh, there are many layers to unravel before you can understand co-addiction. Several factors may contribute to this type of behavior. A co-addict will put all of their energies into an addict. In addition to not setting boundaries with an addict, which is very important, the addict is contributing to life in a negative way so a co-addict can comfortably place the blame where the blame is rightfully due and declare that the addict is the source of the problem. As a recovering co-addict, this person says, I find we have the tendency to create a little niche for ourselves, a place to hide. It is in this tiny camouflaged corner of the room where we can take cover and get the attention off ourselves. But how does co-addiction manifest? So there's different types of co-addictive behavior. And what I'm reading to you is found on Addiction Blog at the American Addiction Center resource. It's got a lot of good stuff. They got health numbers and stuff. If you ever wanted to reach out, they got... Uh, ebooks and everything for quitting smoking, drinking, relationship, addiction recovery, marijuana. It looks like a really good site. So a co-addict truly believes that if they can control their own behavior and the behavior of their loved one, they have the power to change the addict. And what it ends up happening is very opposite. Some co-addicts will cover up for addicts' behavior, lies, and unmanageable lifestyle. They live life on their best behavior in hopes that focusing their love and attention on the addict will make this person see the error of their ways. Others will scream and yell, make threats and try to control the addict's behavior. They will threaten drug dealers, call cops. They will call the cops on their loved ones, ignore, plead, beg and cry. They will try to, to bring the addict to their knees any way they can. Some may become obsessed with the addict's behavior. They track emails, intercept calls, follow the addict around. And there are many variations of how, co how a co-addict may deal with his or her situation. But having the illusion of control is usually the theme. So additionally, the co-addict is normally a giver, a person who thrives on picking up the pieces for somebody else. A co-addict may need to feel needed. A co-addict is an individual whose life is turned upside down, is filled with chaos, emotional turmoil, fear, denial, obsession, and compulsion because of their life of the addicted loved one. Is this making sense? I can relate. Yes. So the underlying issue which drives co-addiction so as a co-addict in recovery, this person writing the article, I find that subconsciously we choose loved ones that enabled us to hide from ourselves. Co-addiction, much like addiction, may be the symptom of an underlying issue. We know that addicts use alcohol or drugs to fill a void or escape. If a co-addict is addicted to a person or their behavior, they may also be trying to deflect their own issues Per, or perhaps fill a void. These voids are underlying issues that may stem from childhood scars, traumatic incidents, low self-esteem, and or growing up in an addict, with an addicted parent. So us addicts and alcoholics, a lot of the times there is an underlying reason why we choose drugs and alcohol to cover up the pain that we feel. An addict to an addict, a co-addict, will often become this co-addict in the same type of behavioral mindset that an addict does because they've had childhood trauma or they've grown up in a situation and they're using that to cope with the way that we coped with alcohol or drugs. And co-addiction is a cycle. 
We are what we know. A, a history repeats itself. If a co-addict is not dealt with his or her own issues and worked through emotional scars, then the relationship they pick may be the way to relieve that past. If a co-addict knows pain and suffering, they may choose a person who recreates this feeling for them. Until this unhealthy pattern is recognized and dealt with, a co-addict may continue to recreate a particular situation or feeling in an unconscious way and then try to fix it. For example, if a woman was raised by an addicted parent and grew up with the feelings of anger, shame, sadness, and fear, she may choose a similar life partner. She may choose a man who brings up the same feelings that are, are comfortable for her. If she never forgave or came to some resolution with the addicted parent, this woman may choose a man that is familiar to her and hope possibly on some unconscious level that he can make things right. Co-addicted behavior is just as much an issue for the co-addict as addiction is for the addict. And until this pattern is broken, co-addictive behaviors could last a lifetime. So that's what we're driving to here in this book right now. What oh, is Ben Shapiro? <laughs> <laughs> All right, where are we at? Michael um, says that hit boundaries. home. Your job is to, when I'm just blabbing, is to keep up on these comments. Well, it, okay. Thank you. <laughs> I just let you blab. Because they're learning. Hey, Holly, some days I'll struggle with boundaries, but I'm getting better. Awesome. Rosie D, good. That's what we're here for. We're here for education because if we don't stop learning or if we stop learning, we're going to stop recovering. And that's not good. Ouch, that hit home. Covering up pain is stressful drinking. That's me. Yeah. I feel you, brother. Andrew Myers, how you doing? Thank you. <laughs> I think I should. <laughs> Took my mother's life in this case. Mm. Thank you for this meeting because drug court isn't testing as often as usual. Got tested today and then the urge hit to go and use. Yeah, but three meetings later, I'm doing better. Good. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you didn't use because you never know. They might hit you again tomorrow just because there's uh, usually a pattern to it. Nope. Sometimes I'll get you. And Al-Anon is awesome for Absolutely. I agree. So I want to talk about this because I would technically be the person that would fit into that category of the co-addict. But I don't think I've, I fit completely into that category. And I don't know if there's other people out there that feel the same way about that. Because... I don't feel like I was trying to control you to fill a void that I had. I felt like I was trying to control you because somebody I loved was trying to kill himself and it was painful. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I kind of fit into the co-addiction category, but at the same time, not completely. So I don't know if there's like another name for that, that maybe we'll go over one day. Maybe I'll right, do some research we'll into it. Right in this book here in a second. But I don't know. There are other family members out there that feel the same way. And did you find yourself being sucked into your addict's addiction? Because I felt myself being sucked in. And luckily I read articles and did research and figured out for myself how to get out of it. But is there people that can relate? So in many cases, the addict is the first family member to seek treatment. So basically what this first paragraph is going to be talking about is the addict needs treatment, but then so does the co-addict. The co-addict needs treatment for trying to control. And when they try to control what, and when you try to control what you're powerless over, you will lose over what you can imagine. So there's early stages to this becoming the co-addict because you don't just start off just like us druggies. We didn't start off slamming meth and heroin or, you know, drinking a fifth a night. It gradually creeped up on us. And before we knew it, the habit, it, I, I equate it to a survival mentality. The addict starts partying and drinking and having fun. And then it turns into a habit. Then you're hooked, you're addicted, then you're lying, you're stealing. And when you're in that severe act of addiction, 
you are surviving. Your mindset, your everything habitually in your mind is geared towards surviving to stay high. And I think the co-addict dealing with the addict becomes the addict in that same way, like it says here. So the early stages, it says normal problem solving attempts. It's the early stages. This is when they realize there's a problem and all of a sudden they start to act a certain way to try to solve the problem. And the normal reaction within any family to pain, crisis, and the dysfunction of one member of the family is to reduce the pain. That's, that's normal. If there's pain in the family, the natural behavior is let's fix and reduce that pain. So the co-addict, in an attempt to do that, to ease the crisis and to assist the dysfunctional member in order to protect the family, these responses do not make things better when the problem is addiction because these measures deprive the addicted person of the painful learning experience. So that's kind of one boundary that you should draw immediately. If your co-partner or whatever is the addict and you're not, understand you're not going to be able to pull them out of it. It's you're powerless to change their behavior. And this is basically telling us to let them have a painful experience. Don't, so, don't solve that problem for them because then that becomes enabling. So because these measures deprive the ad addicted person of the painful learning experiences that bring an awareness that the addiction is creating a problem at this stage, co-addiction is simply a reaction to the symptoms of the addictive disease. And it's a normal response to an abnormal situation. So what we were learning in that blog is a co-addict is somebody, and you know, maybe that's the extreme of somebody who's pain and suffering from childhood. They become the co-addict and choose a partner that resembles the, what they grew up in because that's subconsciously what they know. And that's, we are what we know. And, you know, unconsciously we choose what we know and that's what you knew. So you choose somebody that's very similar to the past you grew up in. And that's a continuation and a, progressive development of co-addiction. Is that Linkies? Yes, I'm from Take Your Meds. Link Tab Meds. Okay, so we went through the early stage. Now look at, let's look at this middle stage. Habitual self-defeating responses. When the culture prescribed responses to stress and crisis do not bring relief from pain created, when culturally prescri prescribed responses and stress of and crisis do not bring relief from the pain created by the addiction in the family, the family members try to ha try even harder. So when they first realize there's a crisis and pain, they try to solve that problem. They see that, that those efforts are not working. They try harder. And that's maybe where it was getting at when it was saying they'll call the cops, they'll call dealers, they'll throw fits, they'll scream and yell anything to try to bring that addict to their knees. Um, they do the same things only more often, more intensely and more desperately. They try to be more supportive and more helpful and more proactive, protective, sorry. They take on the responsibility of the addicted person, not realizing that this causes the addict to become more irresponsible. Let me read that one more time. They take on the responsibilities of the addicted person, not realizing that this causes the addict to become more irresponsible. Now, think of some examples of how you could take on the responsibility of an addict to enable him to be him or he or she to become more irresponsible. That there's a lot, there's many of them out there. Like cleaning up the room, doing laundry are basic ones. Uh, finances, if they're spending more money, say you guys are on a budget, you've budgeted your partner with a hundred bucks and they're out there spending over that hundred bucks within the first week and you keep giving them another hundred and they keep giving them another hundred until the budget's broke. You know what I mean? Just things like that in this middle stage is what will enable the addict to continue deeper in their addiction, not feeling the negative effects of the addiction and then turning the person that's enabling them into a co-addict. It's a synergy effect. Things get worse instead of better. And the sense of failure intensifies the response. Family members experience frustration, anxiety, and guilt, and they're growing self, they're growing self blame, lowering self concept, self-defeating behaviors. They become isolated. They focus on addictive behavior and their attempt to control it. They have little time to focus on anything else. And as a result, they lose touch with the normal world outside their family. They're so consumed with the addict's behavior and trying to cover up his tracks and clean up his mess 
that they lose friends. They lose, you know, sometimes it breaks. They start breaking relationships because they're trying to cover up and hide for the addict. And they don't want to see their stress and anxiety rolling. I bet a lot of that is out of fear. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's where you're at. It's highlighted. I relate Erin Yost. My mother used with me, used use we with me buy drugs and alcohol for me she was only killing me until i got out of the old lifestyle my mother began john i used one time but because i quickly realized. because i quickly realized that i was doing it i got out of using and reached out instead awesome good right the family suffers where the addict has no self-control yep yep mm -hmm. what if you're both addicts then you got two problems you could be the co-addict and the addict. Yeah. <laughs> I would that's assume. That's a tough one. We're not psychiatrists, psychiatrists, psychologists, doctors, or anything like that. So super professional help. See a physician or uh, a licensed psychologist. But we are here reading licensed certified material from addiction. And if you're both addicts, then you got an uphill battle because not only do you have to deal separately with your own addictions and separately with your own character defects, without crossing that line into increasing and intensifying those character defects. So that's a tough one. Uh, Cause with our relationship, I had to deal with my addiction, my character defects and that, and then she had to work on herself without the addiction part, but the co-addiction that started to build up inside her. And so she took her path to counseling with some ladies up at a church and the books that she went through while I was doing mine and we've slowly started kind of weaving back together because the addiction started putting a wedge between us yeah. and then counseling. Well, once I quit and then she started realizing, wow, I've been, a, I've been an enabler and wow, I have some problems that caused me to be that enabler. And then she started working out her own character defects. Then we started being able to drift towards each other. And now the further into sobriety, we in essence both get, and then we recover as a whole unit as a family with the children and everything, the closer we're getting, the more fun we're having, the less everything's starting to work itself out. And I, I believe that if she were to continue to live in character defects while I was trying to battle, we would have a, a problem. We would bump heads, even though the addiction was gone, where, why are we still fighting? It's because we both have character defects. We separately personally on our own need to work out and then come together. Yeah. If and, that makes any sense. And it's, it's crazy because living with an addict or alcoholic, your life becomes, the chaos becomes routine. And so you get used to reacting a certain way to their behavior. And then he started getting help and I started getting help and realizing that I needed to break the routines of my reactions toward what he was doing. Even when, because I remember the last kind of fight we got in, it was my knee-jerk reaction because of how I used to react because sometimes it was the only way that I felt like he could hear me. But with the um, all the things he was learning, I realized that was me reacting to the old addict and not the new recovering addict. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody. But that routine of reaction is very hard to break. Ken says, <clears throat> I was the alcoholic and my ex-partner had a gambling problem. Both turned to toxic relationships. My ex-partner had a gambling problem. Both, yeah. He's right. So you're seeing it. That's good. Hey, however you say that name. Hi, Andrew, son. Andrew, what Andrew are you? Do I know you? Are you the Andrew up at Action? LOL, did not mean to type the second sponsor, but my, we could use it. Hey, maybe sometimes we need to. I I had to when I was, uh, I still consider him my other counselor, but I have my sponsor. And if you watched uh, five or so streams ago, you saw Dell come on here. He's my AA uh, recovery sponsor. And then I have another counselor who I go see who works on base and he's a pastor of a church, two times a doctor. Dude is just brilliant. And he's, and I'd look for two sponsors in particular that aren't afraid to tell this knucklehead the hard things I need to hear. Hey, Mike Hawk. What's going on, brother? <laughs> Mike. Felice, yes. Yeah, good. I think the other hard thing, too, up, going Andrew? back to enabling 
as I feel like it's hard to draw those boundaries when you're married. <laughs> because there's things that you can do to like a child that you can't do to a spouse. Like you can have your child, if they have children, their kids can get taken away and they right can on. hit bottom that way. But being a married couple, I still had to have the responsibility of taking care of the kids, taking care of the bills, making sure everything was in order. And I don't know where the line was where I was enabling. That was a hard, hard boundary to find. Buying their Alcador says buying their alcohol for them, making sure they have just enough to stop DTs. However, the alcoholic wants more. So the co-addict gets them more. So they don't leave the house pretty much trying to control the alcoholic. Yeah. That's exactly what we're talking about right there. Yeah. I finally just had to deal with the fight and just let him be angry at me and tell him no. And that those are hard boundaries to set because you don't want to get yelled at or you don't want to feel like you're in trouble. And so you give in. But once you set those boundaries then they're able to, I guess, feel the pain or whatever you called it in that book. Mm hmm. Alicia, our kids went to every meeting with us too. We, they still do. They still join us for AA, NA. We had that family group therapy up at Action. It was really awesome. Polly, oh, I feel you. It's awful scary. And that's why I drank so much back then and washed the, yep. We don't ask for money, Andrew. We do this for free because we love serving. I'll, I'll put the book in there again. Actually, we have a $100 giveaway if you guys are interested. I'll show that at the... Oh, man, we're already half hour in. I got Stay so much more to cover. Sober by Terrence. Gorski. Gorski. Hmm. There it is again. Staying Sober by Terrence Gorski. Uh, at, when I transitioned, I went up to my counselor and I said, Hey, uh... That's awesome. We read Drop the Rock and Serenity Now or Serenity, Search for Serenity. Uh, do you got any other deeper type of books? And this is the first book he recommend, uh, recommended. was, And the reason he recommended it is because it's a guide for relapse prevention. And if you'd been, if you go back through, we've gone through this whole book. We are now on chapter nine. Was that nine? Yeah. We're on chapter nine and this nine is the family involvement in the relapse. So everything leading up to chapter nine has been focused on us, our character defects, warning signs, and the book. I love it. It's so simple. It talks about us walking up a down escalator. And as soon as we stop, that's when relapse happens. And when you get to the bottom, that's when you use drugs or alcohol. So if you're not continually making progress up this down escalator, and you start going down, you're going to end up back in the bottle. But that's when relapse happens. Relapse happens when you stop moving up. When you start holding still, character defects start taking you down. That's when you. That's when relapse starts. And sometimes it starts subconsciously. So this book is trying to ingrain in your head these warning signs, these character defects. And if you're on our private Facebook group, I put all 30, 37? Is it 37 or 31? 37. 37 warning signs that we all share that we can learn and just memorize and start focusing on throughout the day of possibly stopping on this up escalator. And so we don't end up back in the bottle or on some pills. All right. I got a lot to cover. So let's, let's get through this. So here comes the chronic stage and that's where I got to bust out some education on. And I had to do it for me because I needed that deeper understanding of what the heck is going on. So the continual, the continued habitual response to addiction in the family results in a specific repetitive circular pattern of self-defeating behavior. These behavior patterns are independent and self-reinforcing and will persist even in the absence of the symptoms of the addictive disease. See? The things the family members have done in sincere effort to help have failed. And the resulting despair and guilt bring about confusion and chaos and the inability to interrupt dysfunctional behavior, even when they are aware that what they are doing is not helping. The thinking and behavior behavioral of the co-addict is now out of control. And these thinking and behavioral patterns continue independent of the addiction. That's what I was getting at earlier. You get rid of the drugs and alcohol you still have this, this thinking and behavior pattern that continue. And that's what needs to be solved. So basically what this chapter is trying to pin down 
is that obvious the addict who is addicted to drugs and alcohol needs help. They need help quitting. And once they get over the quitting part, they need help in recovery. That's extra curricular, whatever you want to say, help in recovery through counseling, any type of program that you can find out there to continue learning how to stay recovered. But because of his or hers uh, habit of addiction, the person that was affected often doesn't realize that they were affected in this way and need to seek help outside of, of abstinence from alcohol and drugs as well. So if you find yourself in this situation and you're the partner of an addict and things don't just don't seem like they're working, reach out to al -Anon. I think Alicia said that. Yeah. Reach out to al -Anon or a counselor at a program who offers that kind of support or even go to AA meetings yourself. Because once the, mm -hmm. uh, the addiction is broken and uh, drugs and alcohol are gone, you forget that you were there to quit the drug and you start realizing, oh man, I'm here to work on my noggin, my feelings, the way my whole life has been and everything I deal with is with this addict mind. And that's why things are failing. And you're like, oh yeah, I was here to quit. And then you realize, wow, the whole world could benefit from learning these 12 steps and learning these tools. And I think, like I said before, that's us addicts and who have been through recovery and through programs have a one up on everybody in this crisis because we've been given the tools how to get through this. And now we can reach out to people and help them as well. All right. So here's the sentence that I had to study. Co-addict degeneration is biopsychosocial. Biopsychosocial. The co-addicts degeneration is biopsychosocial. All right, so we learned what the co-addict is, right? The co-addict is affected by the addict and becomes this addict from habitual, habitually trying to ease pain and support and love the addict, which just doesn't work. It just snowballs because you cannot control people. No, you cannot. Just your reaction. And so you got the co-addict, right? Now you got degeneration. And degeneration is the state or purpose of being or becoming degenerate. It's a decline, a deterioration. And this has to do with your physical state, stress, anxiety, your health, your heart, your, your appetite, degeneration. So when it says the co-addicts, degeneration is biopsychosocial. Biopsychosocial is three elements into one for your mental health. And I'm going to pull this up and take a screenshot. Oh, let me get rid of that comment so we can read this better. So your biology, the, bio, the biological, is your physical health. It's your neurochemistry your metabolic disorders, your genetic vulnerability, your immune system, your com uh, what's that? comorbidity. That's a uh, comorbidity. <laughs> I'm saying it wrong now. But anyway, that word comorbidity. means... Yeah, comorbidity. 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 <laughs> that word right there means like, say you have cancer and because you have cancer, it causes anxiety and depression. And that's what that word means. It's a combination of two or more things about you because of an, an underlining element. So then you got your social environment, right? You got your peer, your work, your school, your culture, your social economic status, your family circumstances. That's your social environment. Then you got your psychological, so your self-esteem, your attitude, your beliefs, your coping skills. And they all come together in your mental health. So it's bio, psycho, social. Does that make sense? So there's all three wrapped into one that creates who you are in your mind up here due to what you're surrounded by. And now you have this addict who has created stress and fear and anxiety. And, you know, they're throwing eggshells on the floor before they walk in the house because they got a bottle of whiskey in their hand in my case. And now you got the co-addict degenerating bio, cycle, and social through their outside world, their mental stress, their self-esteem. And this literally causes physical ailments. Obesity. Obesity, yeah. The ineffective <laughs> attempts to control drinking and drinking behaviors elevate chronic stress to the point of producing stress-related physical illness, such as migraine, headaches, ulcers, hypertension. This chronic stress may also result in a nervous breakdown or other emotional illness. Out-of-control behavior itself is an addiction-centered lifestyle that pervades all life activity even that which seems unrelated to the addiction. Social de degeneration occurs as the addiction focus interferes with relationships 
and social activity. Spiritual degeneration results as a focus on the problem become on the problem becomes so pervasive that there is no interest in anything beyond it, particularly concerns and needs related to higher meaning of life. Recovery from co-addiction means learning to accept and detach from the symptoms of addiction. It means learning to manage and control the symptoms of co-addiction. It means learning to focus on personal needs and personal growth, learning to respect like and like oneself. You start losing respect and liking yourself. It means learning to choose appropriate behavior. It means learning to be in control of one's own life. Because it is a chronic condition, co-addiction, like addiction, is subject to relapse. Now we're talking about two people in the house, say like Fleece and I, she could very well relapse into these anxious fear cycles and start reverting back into her old way of thinking due to my addiction. And then I could possibly relapse, which is not off the table, very much realistically could happen if I don't stay focused on my program. And all of that could, you know, we have to both stay up, going up this down escalator or it's a possible relapse. And once we catch ourselves slipping and falling back down this escalator, we pull out all the tools in our tool bag and we use every stinking one if we have to. And that's picking up the phone. That's calling your sponsor. That's reaching out to people you don't even know on Facebook. That's whatever you got to do to stop that. And that's why this whole last week through, I think, four different Zoom meetings and with my counselor tonight and then a couple of times just venting out to you guys, I threw out my character defects just so that I could continually verbal verbalize them and make sure that I'm staying in recovery, period. You know what I mean? Hey, Burton, yeah. you know what I mean? I wanted to read Cody's. I, I don't know. What's up, Joseph? I don't know if we read this one. Whew, I see your pain, Fleece. Makes me think about what I put my wife through. She wasn't a co-addict, I wouldn't say. She was just trying to keep life and me and the kids going while having to watch me drink. And that's the beginning of it, Cody. Yeah, I would say that's uh, where it starts. Because I don't think I went into full bore co-addiction. No. But definitely the beginning stages of it. And yeah, trying to hold life together. Guaranteed, Cody, you caused her stress and anxiety. And the fact that you had to, or she had to keep life with the kids going while you were drinking was unpleasant. I was actually talking to one of my friends and he uh, didn't realize it was his birthday off opiates, but his wife did. Hmm. And he's like, do you realize what today is? And he's like, no. And she's like, that's the day you quit a year ago. And he was like, what? And it just kind of pointed out the fact of how much it affected her. And what affected her is watching him withdraw off opiates for one. And plus all the behaviors we think that aren't there at the time because we're numb to them. We're numbed. We're not looking for them. We don't even care. Or you forget that even happened. Or you completely forget. The things we don't forget that you get to forget. Awesome, Andrew. I'm glad your wife's watching. I'm glad you guys are. Hopefully you guys are learning, learning something from this. This is the kind of stuff I want to do. I want to actually educate. My, what I did today is I read, educated myself, got a grasp of it, saw how it played out in our lives. Now I'm going to look forward to see how it can. And then I brought it to. Hi, Cassie. I always learn better uh, when, you teach. when I teach. So that's one thing I do. But thanks for the reminder there, Body by Cassie. I am going to have to play our usual inspirational quote. I love the quote of the day. <laughs> inspirational quote of the day by Cassie. Hey, hey guys, back again today with the motivational quote of the day here on Recovering Addicts. Stay away from negative people. They've got a problem for every solution. Albert Einstein. And as always, don't forget, keep spreading that love. Where do we go? Here we are. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Cassie. Cassie. Oh, we love, love it. it. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. That's true, though. Negative people have a problem for every solution. My goodness, you negative people. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> a 
Don't be spreading your negativity around here. Where are we at? Ken, what's that kid say? Hi, Ken. I was getting lazy and needed a meeting, and some of my old character defects started creeping in again. Well, good for recognizing it and jumping into a meeting. I know time's tough. It's tough for everybody right now. And Zoom, it works. It's a supplement. I, I look at our show. What we do here on this stream is to educate first, um, is to have a place to learn tools, to put in your tool bag to when, when the time comes and you need them, they're there to pull out. Second, we're a bridge to help people meet other people and create a community on a private Facebook group where we can throw out our thoughts and feelings if we I'll need to, or click on a person that you're starting to get to know and, and DM them. Hey, I'm struggling. And I know that Aaron, she has reached out to help people. And as actually, I've heard positive things from that. Um, and so we consider ourselves a bridge to recovery. And then we're a place you can come and continue to keep your mind in the recovery mode. But I look at us and I look at Zoom as a supplement. And when I think supplement, I go back to working out and exercising. When you are trying to gain weight and lose weight and you're working out, you're trying to get big muscles, you go get the protein powder and you put it in your shaker cup and you shake it up. That's a supplement. It's good, but it's not good as as a steak, broccoli, and some fruit, but it works. And right now, Zoom and this is just a supplement. So use it while you got it. Right? Keep going, then get help. Stop being codependent, by the way. 80% of the time, I'm alone regardless because I've been working on addiction and codependency recovery for more than 90. Good for you, brother. Andrew says you're right. Hey, Aaron. Hi, Cassie. Sweet. Mama says, hi, Cassie. I don't remember what I was right about. Or is your wife right? Or is all wives right? Hi, Green Eyed Cap. Hello. That's it, huh? Oh, no. Don't send me comments. Probably not that. The, James is right. The internet's acting funky. Have we uh, given you guys the circle of death yet? Uh, while I got you here, let me show this one more time. Oh, Jenny had to kick her father out of her life. Oh, I'm no. sorry about really? that, Jenny. That's a boundary, what? though. It's a ba yeah, it's a boundary. We Jenny know said, people. I had to kick my father out of my life. He's an alcoholic, and he won't quit drinking. However, I also don't need this negative behavior around my children. I on, I swear to God, Jenny, I just did the exact same thing two weeks ago. Exactly. Ex like, exactly. <laughs> but it's a boundary. You have to draw boundaries with addicts. Because like it said on the beginning of this thing, the beginning of this book, what did it say? The responses do not make things better when you coddle them, right? When the problem is addiction, because these measures deprive the addict person of the painful learning experience, painful learning experience. And so I think that's, that's, we have to rest assured in that. You have to rest assured that you can't control him and you protect your family and you do it with a clear conscience and you do it with strength and knowing you're making the right decision. You know, that, and that's, I'm talking to myself right there for, for sure. But check this out on the screen. Boom. Right here, y'all. I can't zoom in. What? All right, so there's a $100 drawing we're going to do. Uh, if you're a member of the Recovering Addict private Facebook page, you share three of your favorite live streams on any type of social media with someone or with somebody that you think it could help. You take screenshot of the three as proof. You post it. You post those screenshots on our private Facebook page with your Boom, Venmo, Cash App, or your Facebook pay name. And next Tuesday, the Link's 21st coming. of April, Bam. we will draw a name and we will right here on live TV send you 100 dollars. Cool. Did you guys need to screenshot this? Ready? Screenshot in three, two, one. All right. There it goes. That's all you get. Good luck. I did post the Facebook group again somewhere. Green eyed kitty cat. All right. Catherine Gardner. Do you do this every evening? Yes, we do. Eight o'clock mountain standard time every night. This is our 30th night in a row. Uh, I was doing, I was producing videos before that. Um, just like little production, 10 minute videos. And then this COVID thing got kicked off and I was like, man, Let's just do it every night and support. So there's actually three of us that do this. There's a six, a seven, and I'm at eight. You got Nicole at Real Talk Recovery at six. You got Sober James at seven, and then you got me here at eight. 
And we have no plans to stop. And even after the COVID crisis goes back, we want to transition this into a place of education for addiction. And uh, another note, I want to break the stigma of addiction and what people actually think of addicts. When you look at an addict, I'm going to read, somebody posted this on the private Facebook page. Uh, it was really good. Uh, Michael posted this. It says, drug addicts are not bad people or just some junkies and losers who deserve to die. They're actually good people who have families that love them, but just end up being a victim of the disease, of addiction, and they can't help it. So if you can't help them, don't hurt them, and instead of judging them, pray for them. And that stigma is the tip of the spear for me, in a sense, to break through. And I think it'll help. I think it'll help once people realize, wow, because I think anonymity is kind of going away, in a sense. The traditions of AA are still very valuable, but some of the stuff I'm coming out and saying this isn't sponsored by NA or AA, but I truly believe in the principles and the program of AA. So I use a lot of their literature. So no, so not tech. How do I just find you? Mm. That would be my cell phone, but you ain't getting my number. <laughs> uh. <laughs> mm. I, you just look up Recovering Addict on YouTube or on Facebook. Yeah, you're fine. Just make sure you subscribe, Andrew. Or you can click the link I posted. Thank you, Marilyn. Rosie D. Oh, let's finish this. Yes. My goodness. Get all, get all distracted. Okay. It's very interesting. It is very interesting, isn't it? Okay, so recovery from co-addiction means learning to accept and detach from the symptom of addiction. It means learning to manage and control the symptoms of co-addiction. It means learning to focus on personal needs and personal growth. Learning to respect and like oneself. It means learning to choose, a, a ch and it highlights the word choose, choose appropriate behavior. It means learning to be in control of one's own life. Because it's a chronic condition, co-addiction, like addiction, is subject to relapse. But a, co a condition of co-addict relapse may be more difficult to identify. Without an ongoing recovery program and proper care of oneself, old feelings and behaviors thought to be under control may surface and become out of control. Life again becomes unmanageable, and the co-addict co is in relapse. Let me read that one more time. Without an ongoing, and this goes for us addicts too, without an ongoing recovery program, the, talking about, think about that, co-addict, my wife, she needs an ongoing recovery program. And that's kind of what this is. This is family recovery. My kids, in a sense, need one too because of the five years I spent neglecting or scaring them. So without an ongoing recovery program and proper care of oneself, you have to take care of yourself. Take care of yourself first. And it's not selfish to do that in the sense if you're because if you're not 100 percent and focused and ready to go, you're not going to be there for your family. Take care of yourself to take care of your family. And that's a, it's not a bad thing. And don't think because you took time to yourself to even unwind and rest and clear your mind or eat healthy. And those are good things you need to do so that when you are present with your family, you're present with your family. Without an ongoing recovery program and proper care of oneself, old feelings and behaviors thought to be under control, thought to be under control, may surface and become out of control. Life again becomes unmanageable. The co-addict is in relapse. And we'll end with that on this book because after that, it talks about relapse warning signs for co-addiction. You got situational loss of daily structure. You got lack of personal care, the in inability to effectively set and maintain limits. Uh, loss of constructive planning. It's a lot of the similar similar stuff as an addict goes through, but it's going to break it down in a co-addict type of way, and we will pick up on that. But I really wanted to get through that first chunk, talk about co-addicts, degeneration, and how it is psychosocial. Psycho, phys what is it? Physical, it psychosocial? every part of you, yeah. Psycho, physical, social. Uh... Yeah, it's crazy. I think we're right here. Jeffrey can't. We just get... had another after show. Oh my gosh, Rain, are you okay? Did you fall out of your bed? Jeffrey, good. I'm Do I need to call it. you? Did you send me a message? Do not hesitate. What's going on? If you want to get a hold of me anytime, shoot me a message to recoveringaddict8 at gmail.com. 
give it 10, 20 minutes, maybe a, a couple hours, but I will get it and I will respond. I mean, I'll just keep that up there for a little bit in case you need it. And then the good question of the day is where's your head and heart at today? Is it in recovery? Where have you been? What's your character? Have you taken inventory yet today? It's a, it's a, it's becoming habitual for me, this taking inventory. I start feeling the character defects and, and the more you start learning the character defects, you see the warning signs of your character defects and this negative mindset. As soon as they start and happen, you catch it. And at that moment you have a choice. You can either live in them. And it's weird because we got grown fond of them and it's easy to live in them and we love them. And so you have a moment, you have at that moment, a choice. You can either live in that character defect or not. And I've been trying not to very hard, even though I do love some of my character defects. And the reason that I'm so sincere and like and eager to do so now is because I look at the past 40 years of my life. Yeah, we've done okay, but I don't want to end up where I was ever again. Know what I mean? I'll put the name of that book back up there again. Yeah. I thought the, I had it here. The book calls a biopsychosocial. Don't forget about the video. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Oh, I'm on it right now. Thank you, Cody. Okay. Just let me do a couple a couple click clickaroos here. How do you spell Terrence? Terrence? No. Terrence. T I think I've slaughtered it a few times. Sorry, Terrence. Terrence Gorski. Gorski. Terrence Boom. Gorski. There's so the it's on my old you. YouTube channel. So I'm going to pull that up. Uh, me and my son watched it. My son was filming me. And you know what? I was actually, uh, I was a little tipsy in this video. I was in my, in my character defects. I Dang named it. the video. It's not called Sting. Moonshiners. So Sting. Moonshiner. So it? There it is. Okay, here we go. I'm queuing it up. Let me do a screen share here. Let me get rid of this one. Screen share. Let me get rid of this comment. Oh, come on. Nope. No removing for you. It's kind of sad, but then it gets happy. So don't, don't worry. And I'm going to do a Chrome tab. I'm going to share with audio. I'm going to share right now. Uh oh, Moonshiners. Kind of, it's really sad. <laughs> it makes my heart hurt watching this I video. remember why we're watching this video, because if it weren't for the grace of God, there goes I, right? So this is June 28th, Thursday, 2, 8, or 2018 at 5.09 p.m. It's acting a little fun. Let's go investigate. You all right, brother? No, I just trying to get over to my house over there. You need a ride? Uh, no, I just live over there. I'm not saying the house on the right. Yeah, I could leave it live. Yeah? No, no. Fires in your. <sighs> Gosh dang it. <clears throat> all right. Let's try this again here. <sighs> You drink moonshine? Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. No, I'm not lying to you. Yeah. <laughs> that's all good though. Yeah. Yeah, my house is over here. Second one on the right, right side there. Still has the other so it's trying to get over there. You want me to get you a ride or you want to? Oh no, it's just right there. Okay. Oh. Yeah, feeling good, huh? Well I was. <laughs> did it kick in? It did. Oh good. It's like, uh, that's not so good. Yeah, moonshine, that's a bad thing. Yes, sir, it is. Okay, I'm going to try to waddle over my house. There. Okay. Oh, holy cow. That's some good stuff. It's very good, in my opinion. <laughs> I don't know about anybody else's, but... Oh. I'm going to walk, walk over there or not.
Want to yeah. get a bike and hang on to a bike and like rock with the bike? Uh, if I had a bike, I would do that. Well, maybe we can get you a bike. Oh, uh, we're all flat. Oh my gosh, I'm all wobbly, man. It's too hot out. You need a cup of water. I know, right? Yeah, it's too hot for that. For sure. All right. Mm. Oh, this ain't good. Mm. Well, let's get you home. I'm going to go get my car, okay? If you don't have a problem with that, I'd I appreciate it very much, definitely sir. Definitely don't have a problem with that. I'll be right back. Dude, I am fucked up now. Like so. Sorry about that. It's all good. Bush! Thank you for not calling the cops. I mean, seriously. Oh. It's so ridiculous because I'm just right here. Okay. Yes, sir. I am so embarrassed, man. This is so ridiculous. It's all good. You want to just chill for a minute? Just give me a couple of seconds. I'd really honestly appreciate this. So I walk down there and I see those good hill. I'm going to try to model under the house. Let's chill for the last thing I'll do is call the cops. I don't call cops. No. I don't either. I truly, honestly, 100%. I appreciate your advice and your hospitality has just been marvelous. Come I'd over and say hi. Not a, not a problem at all. You need help in or are you gonna make it? No, I think I'll be okay. Okay. I'll stand by just in case. Fingers crossed. <laughs> no, I really honestly think. Well there it was. Kind of a virtue. It's sad but happy. You know what I mean? I was. That's where the what we were reading. If it weren't for the grace of God, there go I. And so there's another one for your prayer list. I'm not sure. I haven't seen the guy for a while. We saw him every day. Did we see him last summer? We saw him last summer. Yeah. He go to the bus stop and walk back home. He uh, was walking around his bike. So the end of that story is he waddles back into his house and uh, his son or daughter, wherever he lit, whoever he lives with. I was like, hey, you know. And they were just like, ugh, rolled their eyes at me like, oh, he's back. Great. So they were feeling like my yeah. wife did in my I addiction. I have something to add to that video. It is heartbreaking. And that did it. It made my heart sad, too. I have something to add to that video. What, bud? Kindness is a virtue. Kindness is a virtue. Kindness is a good thing to be. Be kind to those who are not normally kind. Because somebody could have just... And that's what I was worried about is somebody's going to call the cops on him and then he's in jail for just trying to waddle home. You know what I mean? But at the same time, waddle, was I waddle. enabling? Because I was back in 2018. I was still in my active addiction. In that video, I was buzzing. I probably had a half a pint in that video down in my guts, guaranteed. Uh, so in a sense, maybe I was being an enabler. But I don't know. I couldn't. Do kind things and kind things happen back to you. Karma kindness. Awesome. Where are we at here? Are we doing it? Are we doing this one today? Daily reflections. Yeah. I just want to thank all the Facebook groups out there that let us start a watch party today. Yeah, what's the name of that one? This one is oh, I don't know how to find the name. 
I don't know. I'll find it. You keep talking. Uh, yeah. So thank you. Uh, the other one, I can't remember the name of it either. Terrible at watch parties. I'll figure next time. I'll write it down. But thank you. Um, recovery from addiction and alcoholism. Yes. It's a group with a little blue circle and a moon and like a sun. Thank you guys very much for having a watch party in your group for us. Appreciate that. We love you guys. Yep. Appreciate all of you. And all mm. the people that are there watching, thank you for I tuning in. This recently for a friend, even hospital rejected him for not cooperating. He survived. Wow. We're humans. Just like uh, fate, who, uh, Michael that posted that on the private Facebook group. We're humans. And we're just stuck in an addiction and we we need help through it and we need to be taken care of through it in a sense but not to the point where it's just there has to be boundaries that's that's all i can say is boundaries have to be drawn and you have to get over the fear of the hurt of setting those boundaries and because it's going to hurt as the partner or parent of whoever because they will get mad at you and they will yell at you and they will throw a fit but you have to stand your ground oh yeah i threw lots of fits I have and it's gonna hurt but it will be worth it i have a joke yeah, joke time Ooh, i love jokes 90 degrees is the right temperature <laughs> <laughs> and reina if you need anything because i know you're scared just reach out and green eyed cat uh, that is the stigma we're trying to break that people aren't scared to approach people. I mean, I get it. There are criminals and they deserve to be in prison because of the stuff that they've done, but there is a huge number and millions of numbers of people out there that are uh, addicts that are pretty normal people. And just because of that, they can't be judged. They have to be loved. And that's what we're here for. Uh, if you said we missed his Did you miss your comment? Just wanted to come back to it. No worries. If you want to, for, just forget it. I see clips like this and think maybe I'm not doing so wrong. Uh, what was your comment? Yeah, what was your comment, Mike? Maybe re-comment. I'm looking for it. There, there was a few. We probably missed a couple. Yeah, sometimes these comments get going so fast. And then I notice that it's conversations, and I try not to interrupt conversations between people in the in the group. But Oh, uh, did you see Unks? Comment? Uh-uh. Uncle, Uncle Uncle Tim. Tim. He commented, You want to come give us a hug? Uh, I we want to give you hug. hugs too. You're welcome, Michael. We're gonna read the daily reflections. We're gonna say the serenity prayer and then we're gonna bounce out. Uh but I would like to hear your your question, Mike. Unless that was kind of it. <laughs> Um, he says, for you, I see clips like this and think maybe I'm not doing so wrong or not an addict. Well, what we'll let, we'd have to get into it. We'd have to really get into the what your habits look like. What it, are you out of control? Uh, does step one apply to you? And step one is a convincing of whether or not you are a drug addict or alcoholic. That your life has become unmanageable because of it. And are you portraying the habits oh, now of what it could be in the future? Because it could perpetuate and get worse and worse and worse. So here's your last comment. It says, so I want to ask a question, but don't know, don't want to step over any boundaries or be counterproductive. Not sure if you remember who I am. I left this whole thing a couple weeks ago. I can wait if you want to come back to me. I, I don't, know don't your question remember. <laughs> ask your question. Remember who you I don't remember. I, I've, I've known, we've seen you in here, Mike. I know you're not new. You're welcome, Ken. We're glad you were here. Yeah, please do. If you guys want to help uh, help this out and be a part of the show, basically, you can. if you're on Facebook, you can start a watch party. And in that watch party, you can reply to the people that are commenting on your watch party and interact with them as, you know, maybe they have questions or, you know, post links and get them to join us in this community. And that would be pretty cool. Don't forget, next Tuesday, we're going to do that drawing for $100. Just take three of your favorite streams that you've been through or choose three favorite. Uh, I would suggest number 10. That was Steve. And then I would suggest, I believe, number 27, which was Dale. He was my sponsor that came on and spoke. And then whatever one else you decide. 
Uh, we're going to hang out here just for a minute longer while Mike either comments or not. Hello, Jacqueline. Hey, Jacqueline Carroll. And Petey. 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 You're welcome. And that's what we're here for, education Petey. and recovery. Petey. First off, I need to educate myself. And then when I say it out loud again, it sinks in deeper. And then tomorrow I will be better off for it. And I hope to spread that to somebody else so that tomorrow they're better off for hearing anything that comes out of this mouth anymore. <laughs> Because nothing, nothing good used to come out of it. Is this mine? It is now. I gave it to you. Mm. Mm. Ooh. It's not only the teacher who teaches. And if you guys want, shoot us an email. Oh, Link's got some words of wisdom. It's not only the teacher who teaches the students, but the students who teach the teacher. Yeah. That's so true. I think you got that from Karate Kid. Karate Kid? Is that really from Karate Kid? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Cody. I'm glad you do. It's inspiring oh, to know. Cody you reminded me. No, Cody <laughs> reminded me. For any spouses or family members out there, this article, I share it a lot, but it really helped me to understand what boundaries to set and what I was doing <clears throat> and what I needed to do. So I just shared it. It's like 10 things to stop doing if you uh, love an alcoholic. I feel like it goes for alcoholics and addicts. But read it. It's a good article. So the number one offender, resentment. It says resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From it stems all forms of spiritual disease. For we have not only, for we have not been not only mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. As I look at myself practicing the fourth step, it is easy to gloss over the wrong that I have done because I can easily see it's a question of getting even for a wrong done to me. If I continue to relive my old hurt, it is a resentment and a resentment bars the sunlight from my soul. If I continue to relive hurts and hates, I will hurt and hate myself. After years in the dark of resentment, I have found the sunlight. I must let go of resentment. I cannot afford them. Agreed. Oh, here it is. So what makes someone who drinks just to relax and someone who is an addict, like drinking beers, drank about 50 since I left two here two weeks ago. Not every night, but like two to four nights a week. Well, I think the rule of thumb is he doesn't do hard liquor or anything, he says as well, Mike. Okay, so I'll just throw out some questions. There's actually a video too. Uh, I should post it. I give an alcohol test on one of my videos. If you go into my my, my oh, main okay. published videos, uh, it's are you an alcoholic? And it's a little test that will walk you through how much you drink, and you can do a little score sheet, and then you decide – from there, how much you're drinking and, and is it a problem to you? Uh, is it affecting your health? Is your life unmanageable? Are you a functioning alcoholic? But one thing that's a kind of a rule that I've heard a lot is that if you're wondering if you have an alcohol problem, more likely than not, you do. Um, if it's weighing on your conscience, that's another sign. I mean, what are what red flags are bringing you to watch a recovery show if you don't think you're an alcoholic? I'm not judging if you are or if you're not. And if you're not, that's fine as well. Uh, but it's a, a, it's a question that we can't answer for you, but you have to look inside yourself and how it works. Let me read that real quick. How it works, uh, is about honest. Well, how it works is how you recover, but you have to be honest with yourself. Look in the mirror and honestly examine your life, how much you drink, what effects is it? If is it wasting money? I had one guy tell me one time, he goes, every dollar you spend is a vote. So what do you vote for? Uh, I don't know. There's multiple ways you can look at it look at it, but as a physical, are you an addict alcoholic? Uh, 50 beers in a couple weeks. Maybe you're an average temperate drinker. There are those who can enjoy alcohol. There are those who could go to dinner, have a bottle of wine, have a glass and a half, leave a glass half full and the bottle on the table and walk off. Uh, there are people who can have a six pack of beer in the fridge for two weeks and only have one or two out of it. I'm not that person. If there's a bottle of wine on the table, it's gone before we leave. And I won't eat breadsticks so I can finish the bottle of wine. If there's a six pack of beer in the fridge, 
it'll be gone within a half hour and I'll be at the store getting a 12, 20 or 30, 40 big pack. And so once the beer stopped working for me, I, was, I went straight to hard liquor because I want to be annihilated. If I was doing drugs or meth or weed, I was, I was looking for the highest or drunkest I could get. And I'm not satisfied till I do it. Even with my vape, you can tell I'm still an addict because I've shared my vape with guys at work, you know, before COVID was a big thing. Uh, here, take a hit, and uh, 98% of them can't hit my vape because I have the nicotine level so high, and I got the coils turned up so hot. And then I just chew, I hit it like a chimney. Uh, the way that I drink coffee, I heard James say this. If, he, there's, if he's got a thing of 12 chocolate chip cookies, he's going to eat them all. Uh, so there's this nature of a, an addict that permeates their whole life. And it's not just about drugs and alcohol. And then you got to maybe think about, is drugs and alcohol something you're using to cope? Does it numb you out? And why do you need poison to do that? Why do you have to have alcohol to do that? Why can't you read a book or listen to some calming music or go on a walk or meditate? Why would you need alcohol to cope? Is that a thing? I don't know. Only you can answer these questions. Ooh, and then you got the people with prescribed drugs. Yeah, like prescription me. drugs. I'm a diabetic. Well, that's a medical condition. Yeah. Linky's a diabetic. He can't flush sodium. What? No. Uh, does that make sense, Mike? We can give you a bunch of things to think about. But at the end of the day, if it's bothering you, I would say look at why it's bothering you. Why does it bother you? If it's not bothering you, you just like the educational information. Because the tools that we learn apply to life regardless of drugs or alcohol. Um She's gotten better at it. It helps you cope with life on life's terms. And that's why we read page 417 out of the big book. What do you say? No, I don't get sick. Yes, major urges to drink. It makes me feel good. Yeah, I, dude, I would ask my counselor. I'm like, I don't remember any childhood trauma. I mean, I had the usual divorce and parents fighting and all that kind of good stuff. And, you know, ripped out of a state, moved on, you know, uh, and then my son, he got his head crushed a couple years ago. And even I tried to think, man, can I use this? As, but no, I drank because I loved getting drunk. I freaking loved it. I loved the way it felt. I loved the way as soon as you drink, you'd get the hot belly, that three beer buzz is what I would call it. Uh, and then I'd, and more and more. And then the phenomenon of craving would kick in and I would drink and drink and drink until it was all gone. And once it was all gone, I would go get more or if it was a big enough bottle, I would drink until all of a sudden I just woke up. I'm like, oh, must have been a good night. Mm -hmm. And then I was asking my oldest boy all the time, well, who do I need to apologize to tomorrow? Or who do I need to say, was I a jerk? Was I a punk? You know, all that kind of stuff. Hi, Misha. Misha yeah, in the house. Okay, add something, Brad. Add something, bud. Jail's institution is death. Yep. Alcohol and drugs lead to jail's institutions and death. I went to jail. I landed in an institution. Next time I go out, it's death. I'm pretty sure of it. Hopefully not. And y'all don't forget about Holly right here hanging out with us in the corner. She's on the front lines tonight. She will be joining us either Thursday or Friday night. I don't know yet. She's keeping us posted. She's staying sober after her little her little uh, bump in the road, as I like to call it. Uh, but you guys know the story. She dumped her whiskey out. She stayed sober for like five days, went back to drinking. And now she's, she's a nurse, but she got called out. So she wants us to keep, to keep her in our thoughts and prayers. And so we put her here to hang out with us. That's what she looks like tonight. She's around 65 people affected with it. And the 20 staff people around the affected people are affected with it. So hopefully she comes through that okay, which I'm sure she will be. What made me an alcoholic is opening a bottle of beer up, back up and back. And my dad can sit with one for almost two. Yeah, not me. I can't sit with one. Here in Utah, I'm sure it's the same in a lot of other places, but the liquor store, and that's what I got real fond of drinking was hard liquor whiskey. But the liquor store is closed on Sunday, and I would try to have to, I would have to try to buy enough whiskey on Saturday to make it to Sunday, or I would end up drinking beer. And I hated it and I would slam it. I would I ended up actually having this huge like beer stein, and I would dump three or four beers in that thing, and then I would try to just like chug it. But, but, but. Hoping to get as drunk as I would on whiskey, but it never worked. I just got tons. Makes a lot of sense, actually. Maybe I'm just a casual drinker. I don't think until it gets too late. 
Right on. We, hey, we appreciate you for watching and being here. No judgment here, no nothing. But it's a question that you just need to look at from various angles. And if you can have a couple beers, and because in moderation, and people that can moderate, and I'm not one of them, in moderation, you know, a couple beers of every week or two it ain't, ain't going to kill you. I'll be glad to have her back. She's been our hero. Heck yeah. I can't wait till she comes back to you, Aaron. That's going to be a good one. Mm-hmm. Right on. Praying for Holly. Me too. Good night, Cody. Good night, Cody. Cody goes out there and saves the world too, man. Keep him in your prayers. We're always here. Yep, absolutely. See, Aaron's one of those just I love the way she supports people. I have something, I have something for them to remember. That's if you're that's if you're camping. How much do you drink when you go camping? I wonder. Camping. Oh boy. No, camping. That was good. <laughs> I remember when we were in the Oh yeah. Okay, so tomorrow we will pick back up on uh co addiction recovery and relapse prevention for the co addict. And is anybody celebrating 60, 30, 60, or 90 days, birthdays? Let me ask that real quick because I made three special videos just in case there's people in there who didn't get a 30, a 60, or a 90-day tag. And I made you a special video if you did not. Let me know, and I'll play it right now. Yeah, I know. Because it's for you. So that's got one coming up here soon. And Tracy, if you're in the house, you got one coming up here pretty soon. Yeah. So make sure we get yours. And if if you get to our <clears throat> our birthday board or whatever, she keeps a thing on people's birthdays. When your birthday comes up, we'll make a individualized video just for you. But if you just pop in and you haven't had your key tag coin for 30, 60, 90, if anybody shows up, we got special videos to pull the trigger on just for that. Not not triggering your addiction. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we don't want to trigger that. No relapses up in hell. Yeah. Relapses. Unless you're 60 days on the 17th. Do we got his birthday now? I think we do. Uh, I don't think I do. Michael Teeter. That name sounds new. The only relapse you have here is running. Oh, look at Michael Teeter. All right, Michael, we got a video for you, bro. This is for you. This is for Michael. I hope I play the right one now. <laughs> All right, brother. Happy, Happy 30 congratulations days. on that. Ooh. Keep coming back. Keep coming back for you, for real. All right. 60 days on the 17th. Aaron says you could be a casual drinker and no problem with that. Absolutely. Everything in moderation, but you can always keep coming back. Nothing bad about learning about addiction. You don't know who you could help. Absolutely. Beautiful way. There's another angle to look at it. I love it. You're welcome, Mike. T-T-E-T-O-R. 60 days. Corey, what's up, brother? The 17th. Hey, Jaden. So are we going to wait till the 17th to play that one? No, hey. we'll make him a special one. If they get oh, on the kitty? birthday board, they get a special one. But if it's somebody right. that just happens to pop in, we have a 30, a 60, and a 90-day right. special video, just in case you didn't get one and we need What's to say good job. Katie Ewan's and Nets will be the same. Hers is her. Same, Jeffrey. Six month. Zanette's six months. Sweet. I need to put that on my, my tracker. Ready? All right. Who are we not? God. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, change the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Well, I hope you guys learned a lot because I know I sure did. And let's put it into practice tomorrow. Let's not forget where is our head? Where is our heart? Is it in recovery? Uh, stay focused and stay strong. Pray for those. Help somebody. Ooh, we'll be back minutes. tomorrow. I must have something. Be back tomorrow. What, like? Um, teachers don't, students don't learn from teachers, but teachers learn from students. Oh, very good, bud. Try to kid. 
Stay strong, work your program, and remember, we recover, recover better, better together. together.